cooks aquaculture come down and they don't ask you, they pretty well tell you. Okay? And the government's working hand in hand with them. What I try to do uh, in many of the discussions that I have with people uh, is try and move the debate from should salmon farming happen to it's going to happen, how should it happen? Save our fish! Save our fish! And to me, aquaculture is a natural fit, is a natural fit uh, with our coastal communities, and I think there's opportunities. This has nothing to do with community development. This has to do with developing the profit margin of Cook Aquaculture. And also, the province seems to think it's going to improve its bottom line as well. When I got this call saying all our lobsters are dead, I thought it was a joke. Uh, it was unimaginable. Stuart Lamont is Managing Director of Tangier Lobster, a Nova Scotia company that buys and stores lobsters in New Brunswick. In 1996, his company and three others were holding 200,000 pounds of lobsters in a natural pound in Back Bay, New Brunswick. I was assured very, very quickly this was no joke, the lobsters were dead. So four companies put their employees and trucks on the road and at 10 o'clock at night, we wound up in Back Bay, New Brunswick, uh, looking down on a natural pound in which two of the three components of the facility uh, had been drained dry, and here were thousands and thousands of pounds of dead lobster on the shore. Uh, that part of the whole story is, is very, very fresh in my mind. It's as if I were there last night. Um, come to find out, to make a very long story short, a salmon farming operation across the bay had had a lice problem and the best and most effective way to deal with lice is to treat it with cypermethrin. Cypermethrin is illegal in Canada but it is, at least it was, legal in the United States. The salmon farmers had purchased cypromethrin in the United States, brought it to Canada, and doused their fish with it. The currents carried the poison across the bay, where it wiped out the lobsters. The lobster company sued and won a six-figure settlement. That was in 1996. This is the headquarters of Cook Aquaculture in Blacks Harbor, New Brunswick. In November 2011, Cook was fined $40,000 for the improper use of a pesticide, and later that month, the company and three of its executives were charged with 33 counts of illegal use of cypromethrin after a mass lobster kill in Passamaquoddy Bay in 2009. As I speak, in the spring of 2012, the case is still before the courts. Cook's is unquestionably the major player in aquaculture in eastern Canada. On two occasions, we asked them for an opportunity to do an interview with them, and on both occasions, they refused. Salmon farms began in Norway and soon spread to Scotland, Ireland, Chile, British Columbia, and elsewhere. But the heaviest concentration in the world is around the New Brunswick Islands in the mouth of the Bay of Fundy. Now the industry wants to expand across the bay to Nova Scotia. Their initial proposals affect five communities. Cook has applied to establish or expand salmon farming in four communities in southwestern Nova Scotia, St. Mary's Bay, Shelburne, Jordan Bay, and Port Mattoon. The fifth application is for the Sheet Harbor area on the eastern shore. The applicant there is Snow Island Salmon, a joint venture between a New Brunswick operator and a Scottish company named Loch Duart. These plans are meeting with fierce resistance. Of 135 submissions from St. Mary's Bay, 134 were opposed, and those communities are now suing the provincial minister for authorizing two huge salmon farms without doing a proper consultation and review. The Conservative government in Ottawa and the NDP government in Halifax seem determined to impose net cage salmon farms on coastal communities, which is very odd because the federal NDP is firmly opposed to them as was the provincial NDP when it was in opposition. Here's opposition leader Darrell Dexter in 2007 speaking against fish farms in Port Mattoon. Last week I was down 
uh, in southwest Nova with some fishermen uh, talking about what's going on in coastal communities. They're all concerned that the provincial government lacks leadership when it comes to rural, uh, to rural communities, when it comes to coastal communities. Because they are not listening to the people of these areas. This is a lack of leadership in government. And the first way that they can turn this around is by demonstrating that with respect to this project, they're going to say no. But now he's the Premier, and his government strongly supports a massive expansion of salmon farms in the province's little coves and harbours, including Port Mattoon, which still doesn't want them. We call them salmon farms, but they're not really farms. They're actually feedlots. Essentially, a net cage feedlot consists of bags of netting hanging from floating platforms. Tens of thousands of small fish are dumped into the nets, fed and held until they reach market size. Then they're pumped out and slaughtered. These farms can be enormous. The two new farms in St. Mary's Bay are licensed for 1.4 million fish. But compact monocultures like this are a paradise for parasites and disease. And because net cages just hang in the water, all kinds of things can pass in and out through the mesh, from small fish and crustaceans to viruses, bacteria, parasites and pesticides. And so certain problems occur with salmon net cages everywhere, just as naturally as green grass occurs in the spring. The basic problem with farm salmon is they break the natural laws. In nature, the wild salmon is always moving, so the waste never collects. And pathogens have a lot of trouble jumping fish to fish because they're constantly moving. And any salmon that's a little bit slow, a little bit wobbly on the edge of the school, there's a predator takes it out at every age, class, and size. There's always predators trimming up these schools. And so you don't get epidemics. Alexandra Morton was once described by a journalist as the citizen scientist who overcame intimidation by bureaucrats, indifference from government scientists, and dismissals from industry to force the plight of wild salmon to the top of British Columbia's political agenda. Then you take now a salmon farm. It really doesn't matter what you put in there, whether you put a Pacific salmon or an Atlantic salmon, it's the same dynamic. Um, the wild fish come by and they infect the farm fish. They, that's definitely part of the dynamic, sea lice, viruses, bacteria. The wild fish go into the rivers, they die. The farm fish, everybody is pressed together and so the pathogens are having a heyday. They're jumping fish to fish to fish and now they're competing against each other so it increases virulence. This has actually been studied. It, it makes them more virulent because there's no longer any reason for those pathogens to live lightly on their host. Take sea lice for example, small crustaceans that lock onto salmon and feed on their mucus, blood and skin, creating deep open wounds that provide an invasion route for bacteria and viruses. A few sea lice can kill an immature salmon, and larger numbers can weaken or kill even a fairly large fish. To combat sea lice, salmon net cage operators lace their food pellets with drugs and pesticides. As the lice become resistant to those chemicals, the operators move to stronger ones. They may also pump the fish into tank boats, where the fish are bathed in chemicals like hydrogen peroxide. When that fails, some operators, at least, move to strong but illegal pesticides like cypermethrin. And that's the story behind the chemical kill that wiped out Stuart Lamont's lobsters in 1996 and wiped out thousands more in 2009. Drugs aren't the only foreign substance in salmon feed. The flesh of farmed salmon is white, not salmon colored. It arrives in the supermarket salmon colored because it's had dye in its food. Other fish sometimes pick up salmon feed that's fallen through the cages with odd results. Here's Guy Melville, a retired scientist who lives in Freeport. There, there's a salmon colored pollock. It's, uh, it's in my freezer. <laughs> and as naturally as birdsong in summer, masses of salmon produce masses of feces. Wild Atlantic salmon spread their waste over huge stretches of ocean. They migrate between eastern Canada and Greenland, but farm salmon drop their waste right through the bottoms of their cages. 1,800 metric ton of waste. That's what these sites in one year are going to produce. Yeah. And that is the equivalent, equivalent of Digby County, all going to the bathroom. That's what's being dumped down here on our bottom every year when they get up into production.
They can come shit all over us and they don't have to uh, look after their waste. That's why they have 52% profit. 52%? Well, Cook Aquaculture is a private company, so we don't see their financial statements. But a Department of Fisheries and Ocean Studies set the average return on investment of net pen operations at 54%. In 2011, Cook had revenues of more than $500 million and a war chest big enough to try a hostile takeover of Clearwater, the dominant seed food company in eastern Canada. But their profits are high partly because salmon feedlots don't pay for all their costs. Inka Molesky is a marine biologist. The industry is not paying for the waste that it's generating. Um, that's being borne by, by the environment and all the other species that inhabit that environment where fish farms are located. It's really one of those, it, it's out of sight and out of mind to most people. Most people don't get to see what it's like under a fish farm. All they get to see is on the surface and it looks very nice. Leaping salmon, being tossed food, but underneath it's really is, it's a, it's a waste dump. It's a, it's a sewage type environment. What's on the bottom is a toxic sludge up to a meter in depth composed of feces, putrefying food, and dead, disintegrating fish, all spiced with drugs, other chemicals, and dyes. Nothing can live there except a specialized worm and a carpet of bacteria. So what you have here, this is my farm site, mm -hmm. and you can see these white patches that are quite extensive. These are the Begiatoa or Begiatoa mats these bacterial mats that are covering the surface. This bottom is toxic mm -hmm. and organisms really are quite sensitive to the sulfur levels that are there and they would stay away from it. Of the diseases that affect salmon feedlots, the most devastating is ISA, infectious salmon anemia, which arose in Norway and has since spread around the world, often carried by infected eggs. It's incurable, and when it appears, all the hundreds of thousands of salmon in the affected cages have to be slaughtered. ISA almost eradicated the industry in Chile, and there have been several major outbreaks in New Brunswick. Another issue. Unlike most farm animals, salmon are carnivores, so their feed is made up of... Well, here's Daniel Pauly of the University of British Columbia, one of the most eminent fishery scientists in the world. Lots of... Um Mar marine fish or predators. And these predators have to be fed with other fish, with fish meal from other fish. And there is no getting around that. About one third of the fish that are reported, reported caught, about 25 million, 30 million tons of fish, is turned to fish meal. It's reduced to fish meal and fish oil. Of that amount, half is used for um, chicken and, and pigs and stuff, and half for salmon and other fish. So one-sixth of all fish caught is used to grow other fish. If you feed them with other things than fish, they will taste like tofu, they will get sick, and, and it doesn't work. So basically aquaculture needs fish to produce fish, they are this form of aquaculture. The production of carnivores, the more you produce, the less fish you have. This is something that will not get into the head of most people because they see a salmon, but they don't see the sardine that go into feeding it. And in Canada, at least, they don't eat, they wouldn't eat the sardine, but everywhere else in the world, they would. So uh, this is uh, more than a zero-sum game. This is. Uh, we lose when we do aquaculture. Um, we, humanity, um, when you do aquaculture of carnivores. Perhaps the most serious long-term effect of salmon feedlots is genetic pollution, the result of interbreeding between wild salmon and escaped farm salmon. This issue is acute in British Columbia, where Atlantic salmon are an alien species, but it's also an important issue on the Atlantic coast. Wild salmon are born in the shallow headwaters of rivers and spend the first part of their lives in freshwater before swimming down to the sea. 
They live in the ocean for a year or two or more, depending on their genetic programming. And then, navigating with incredibly subtle chemical sensing, they force their way back up the same river to the very spot where they were born. Every population from every single stream is unique, but they all make that incredible journey adapting to two utterly different environments. A farm salmon doesn't have that genetic programming. When escaped farm salmon interbreed with wild fish, they weaken the survival mechanisms of the wild stock. And there are always escapes, just as there are always sea lice. Escapes occur as naturally as snow in winter. Farming salmon, farming fish for food, uh, certainly makes sense on, on a lot of different levels. Uh, it takes pressure off wild stocks. Um, in fact, the, the Atlantic Salmon Federation was very involved with helping the aquaculture industry get started uh, here in uh, uh, this part of, of New Brunswick in, uh, in the Maritimes uh, back 25 years ago. What the Atlantic Salmon Federation didn't see or scientists at the time didn't see was all the unintended consequences and that is problems with disease, serious problems with disease, serious problems with sea lice, serious problems with pollution um, and maybe the most uh, important significant problem the fact that a lot of farm salmon escape. Jonathan Carr is Director of Research and Environment at the Atlantic Salmon Federation. Every fall, he and his assistants intercept the salmon entering the McAdavid River as they come up this fish ladder in St. George, a surreal place in midwinter sheathed in ice. They examine every single fish. They remove the farmed salmon and send the wild ones on their way. When we first started our monitoring program back in 1992, um, there were years when we had um, close to a thousand escapees coming into this one river. And this is only one river we're monitoring. There's several local rivers nearby and many, many other salmon rivers. Um, but as time has gone on, there has been improvements in terms of husbandry practices. We've noticed the uh, scale of escapes have uh, gone down dramatically over the years. But that said, so has the wild returning salmon. So we've had years where we've had over 90% of the fish entering this river or collected, intercepted at this particular fish ladder. Over 90% have been aquaculture escapees versus 10% or less of wild fish. Since 2010, salmon farms have been obliged to report any escapes. But before that, says Carr, the first sign of an escape was typically the sudden appearance of numerous farm salmon in the mouths of the lower Fundy rivers. The industry always claims that their cages won't fail and their fish won't escape. But just one episode in New Brunswick in 2010 saw the escape of 138,000 farm fish. The aquaculture industry says that such escapes really don't matter because real wild fish don't exist anyway. This idea that we have pure stocks running in these rivers is simply not true. Um, we've been stocking these rivers for over 100 years. Uh, you take something like the Marguerite River um, in Cape Breton. Uh, they were, uh, there's uh, uh, hatchery produced salmon from um, the St. John's River. There's hatchery produced salmon from the uh, Richibucto uh, River that's in there. Um, and I believe there's one or two other river strains that have been actively introduced into that river system to try to enhance the stocks. This is long before aquaculture ever showed up. But it turns out that healthy wild salmon runs can simply shrug off the introduction of juvenile hatchery fish that were bred to survive in the wild, as in the case of the marguerite. In, ter in terms of these events where people have stocked fish from strains that are not native to a particular river, salmonids, into to that river system. There have been a number of studies where the geneticists have gone back many years after the original stocking was concerned, and they compared the genetics of the donor population to the genetics of the original population that was in that river and the genetics of the animals that are now there 20 years after the stocking event. And what they're finding is that the genes from those donor populations are gone. So yes, there certainly are intact wild salmon populations, plenty of them, but not in areas of intensive salmon farming. Stocking a river with compatible juveniles is not the same thing as allowing hordes of voracious adult farm salmon to escape into rivers where the native stocks have already been weakened and reduced. Through generations of selective breeding, farm salmon have become so different from wild salmon that some biologists consider them a separate species. And if the spawning grounds contain eight or ten times as many farm fish as wild ones, the wild population can indeed be completely overwhelmed. We took scale samples 
from wild fish entering the McAdavid River pre pre industry, so sa samples taken from the 1970s, and we looked at samples in the 1980s and 1990s and in the 2000s, and we found that the uh, genetic integrity has been compromised within the McAdavid River. And basically, what I'm saying is, we've proved that interbreeding has occurred in the past between wild and aquaculture fish, and uh, the wild fish have actually lost some of their um, unique alleles that are uh, critical for survival in the wild. So the population that we've been trying to recover, we've just found out um, truly is not a wild population anymore because of genetic contamination in the past. What happened on the Macadavic is the most serious effect of salmon feedlots because it destroys the sophisticated genetic composition of unique wild salmon populations. And once the genome of a particular salmon tribe is lost, it's gone forever. Compared with this, the question of housekeeping is minor, but it tells you a lot about the attitude of the industry. Both sides of the Lower Bay of Fundy are littered with salmon farm debris. New Brunswick lobsterman Greg Thompson has watched Cook's abandoned cages breaking up and drifting ashore. To me, this is very easy to fix. I take my my used gear ashore and dispose of it properly. To me, the aquaculture industry should be able to take their used gear ashore and dispose of it properly. On the other side of the bay, Sheldon Dixon has pulled large pieces of aquaculture debris up into his own field. Our shores out here, you know, you can go every, every half a mile, you can pick up salmon pin debris. If salmon farmers do this out where we can see them, what do they do down below where we can't see them? Well, uh, we, we, we monitor this on a regular boat uh, on a regular basis. So I'm confident that, uh, that th this is, uh, these sites are, are regulatory monitored. But I think we have one of the strongest reg regulatory um, systems in Canada. And I have the greatest confidence that, that ours is, is second to none. The industry says the same thing. I can tell you right now that we have some of the strictest regulatory uh, practices in Canada anywhere else in the world. Really? Cook has said that it's expanding in Nova Scotia partially because Nova Scotia's regulations are weaker than those in Maine. Inka Molesky knows something about salmon farm regulations. I was a, an expert witness at the hearings that were held to determine what should the environmental monitoring program look like in, in Maine for fish farms. And I made a series of recommendations about what should be monitored. And it, as it turned out, a lot of those recommendations were uh, incorporated into the management of um, salmon farms in Maine. And as a result, they have a much more um, rigorous, more detailed um, monitoring program than we have in New Brunswick or in Nova Scotia. In Maine, regulators monitor several different indicators, and when those indicators show environmental deterioration, the salmon farm has to take immediate action. In Canada, the only indicator that's monitored is sulfides, which are produced by decomposition under the cages. The industry says, you know, we are highly regulated. There's just all kinds of monitoring that takes place on our fish farms, but in fact, what happens in New Brunswick and in Nova Scotia is when the sulfur levels, the sulfide levels in the sediment reach or exceed 1500 micromolars of sulfide, the response is you do more monitoring. At no point in that process does the government say you need to cut back on production. You need to do something to change those sulfur levels from their seeming trajectory into the, the high values. Minister Beliveau also says that his siting and leasing decisions are based on science. In fact, the industry produces its own environmental assessments, a cozy arrangement, and those documents are then reviewed by government scientists. I really believe in the science, that we have good science. We have some of the best professional veterinarians in the world, and I trust that. I trust that information. And uh, I believe in the conditions and that we've set out in these approvals. And that information has to, has to flow and the community uh, needs to be engaged in that, yes. 
When I asked him for the specific science supporting a specific decision, the minister handed the question to Associate Deputy Minister Greg Roach, who described the application process and assured me that it was all accessible. There, there indeed is a, a, a public screening of the, uh, of the information about fish farms. I asked him for the website address and he assured me that he'd send it. When I later reminded him of it, he had an assistant send me three successive emails outlining the application process, but never provided a single scientific fact. The truth is, his department doesn't have any science. The real story is buried in another comment by the minister. Well, the, we, we've made every effort to make our, our decisions public, and uh, um, I think that you can, we, we are involved in a process where our federal counterparts are involved in the science and stuff and they have, they have some uh, good scientists and they have some good studies uh, that, they, they that they can relate to. In short, the science comes from the feds. Longtime Deputy Minister Paul LaFleche openly admitted that the province has no scientific capacity of its own and relies on the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And other sources say that the province doesn't even get to see the actual studies. The feds simply assure provincial officials that the science is fine. So the expansion of the aquaculture industry rests on the private, unsupported assurances of the management at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the same bureaucrats who managed the Atlantic cod fishery into extinction over the objections of their own scientists. Despite the industry's denials, there's plenty of sound, published, peer-reviewed science on the shortcomings of net cage aquaculture. Indeed, the Royal Society of Canada, the preeminent scientific organization in the country, recently published the report of an expert panel on the relationship between marine biodiversity and climate change, fisheries, and aquaculture. Predictably, it identified the well-known problems with wastes, chemicals, disease, escapes, and interbreeding. The chairman of the expert panel was Jeff Hutchings, professor of biology at Dalhousie University. I asked him specifically about the industry's repeated claims that there's no scientific evidence that salmon feedlots adversely affect wild salmon. What I would say to those who say that in industry is show me the data. Show me the reports, show me the publications, because for anybody moderately cognizant of the science that's been undertaken in this area, um, cannot speak truthfully and, and make that statement. Since the communities can't get access to good science from the government, they're finding ways to do their own. In 2009, Cook applied for a new large site in Port Mattoon Bay, where a smaller fish farm had been operating for 15 years. Convinced that the small farm had damaged the bay, local fishermen strongly opposed the larger one. Ruth Smith grew up in Port Mattoon and still owns the family home there. She and her husband, Dr. Ron Laux, operate an oceanographic consulting firm in Halifax and they offered to help. They began by asking the fishermen how the bay worked. These people had, were working on seven generations of familiarity with this bay. And so we tried to marry the local ecological knowledge, I mean we on both sides, they and us, with uh, the formal science. Together, the scientists and the fishermen negotiated with Cooks to gain access to the existing site, which had been taken out of production. To their credit, Cooks did give them access for three years. Enlisting the aid of Dalhousie University, the team did sediment surveys, took still pictures and video footage, analyzed the chemistry of the water, measured the currents. They raised money to pay for lab work, and they tested the fishermen's theories about the fish farm and its impact on the bay. As it grew, it just kept getting worse and expanded from the fish pond. This is the point. The size of the footprint for, from the sediment analysis extended out at least as far as 400 meters and, and to the ex a further extent of, of two kilometers in areas where there was a depositional areas where uh, wastes tend to, to, uh, to settle. And we took him, Ron out in the boat and he could do his water samples and we did, uh, uh, he had, had drifters, he's a sort of a, a, a weight with a, with a little bit of an underwater kite on it in, in and a buoy up to the surface and that allowed the tides to have all the effect on this instead of the wind. So when the stuff moved, it wasn't the wind that was moving the stuff, it was the tide. And, and different things and a lot of questions he had with us about how 
the tide cycles in this harbor and all that stuff and then he and then he sampled all the stuff and he he verified whatever we was telling him he's found to be fact people got together on that I think that brought um, community people and fishermen and the science team all onto the same page it's like we can do this we can learn and prove what we need to um, be going to government with so our guys got to be you know acquainted with the Dalhousie guys and um, and they listened and learned and communicated and shared. And so they've seen, the, see, a lobster fisherman earns his living by the map that he's got in his head of the bottom. Ron and Ruth say there are three main findings in their work. Just as the fishermen claimed, the fish waste did drive lobsters completely away from what was once a rich lobster breeding ground. The bay does not flush very well, and the footprint of the farm is hundreds of times larger than the lease area. The fishermen's been proved right ever since we started. Because the fishermen are the ones that know the base. But how is it that communities have to hold bake sales to pay for the scientific testing that's needed to show whether their local waters are suitable for aquaculture? Isn't it the job of government to monitor and control the industry? So one would think. But the bureaucrats have become cheerleaders for the industry. Mind you, the bureaucrats can hardly be blamed because their mandates make them responsible for both regulation and promotion, an impossible task. <clears throat> DFO has an inherent conflict in our, in our view in the way it's, it's, it's responsible for the uh, care of our wild Atlantic salmon runs and at the same time DFO is also responsible for the promotion and development of aquaculture and, and we view that as a conflict of interest. Well indeed, that's, that was one of the uh, key recommendations that came from the Royal Society panel as well. That one of the things that inhibits and seriously inhibits in the panel's view, in our panel's view, the ability of, of Canada to fulfill its national and international obligations to conserve and sustain biodiversity lies in this regulatory conflict within, D within Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And it seems pretty clear based on past experience that the promotion of industry typically wins out. Good evening everyone, I'm Cindy Webster, I'm the Director of Aquaculture Management for uh, Fisheries and Oceans. We have not come anywhere near a decision for these sites, we're just starting to look at this, so um, as I said, we take all those concerns very seriously and consider those when we're, we're doing our uh, advice. And I've only been with aquaculture for 10 years, and uh, we have not turned down a uh, salmon farm in the 10 years I've been here. You, you look at uh, DFO's budget for wild Atlantic salmon conservation, management, research, and assessment. In the mid-80s, they had a $25 million budget dedicated to wild Atlantic salmon. Um, today, that budget is less than $15 million. The same internal conflict exists provincially. Remember Inka Malewski's photographs of the seafloor? Those photos were taken in Shelburne Harbour, where Sterling Bellavo used to fish. He's now Nova Scotia's Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture and Environment. So I asked him how he felt about these essentially dead zones in the harbour of his own community. You make reference to certain dead zones in certain harbors, and you made uh, reference well, to Shelburne. So yeah, but I, uh, to me, I have a sensitivity around that because I go there with my Sunday drive, and and I observe a traditional fisheries, and I keep going back to my, to my my, my occupation, and when I drive there, whether I'm there touring what the local pothole situation is on a road, I'm also observing that I know that there's an active lobster fishery, in that harbor. I also know that there's traditional lobster holding facilities in that harbor. So I have some, some uh, sensitivity about the term about a dead zone in Shelburne Harbor. Ah, so I guess it won't matter until the whole harbor is a dead zone. I also asked the minister, if aquaculture is such a natural fit for coastal communities, how come they're booing you and suing you? Well, I see, uh, it's interesting, uh, because I, I come from Shelburne County, where I see other uh, municipalities actually endorse it. So there's a different range of 
exceptions or how uh, people uh, endorse that in, in the local council and municipalities in the Shelburne area is, is on the opposite side of that. It's true. In Shelburne, unlike other coastal communities, a lot of people really do support Cook's expansion plans even in Shelburne Harbour. Shelburne is a shrinking industrial town that badly needs conventional jobs, and jobs are at the heart of the controversy. Our population has shrunk. Uh, there's out migration, people are going out west, families are divided, families have moved, and it's, it's created an a effect on our community that we'll never get over. This is a rural area, and all rural areas around North America have the same problem with migration out of, this, out of the rural areas into the, into the, uh, out, out of the roads into the urban areas. And so when you sit back and you say, we, we want the jobs, well, it's not the jobs. It's, you know, we, want, we, we, we don't want churches closing. We, want, we don't want the school population going on. We want someone to volunteer for, to do figure skating. We want the volunteers for 4-H. We want the kids in 4-H. We want all those things that, develop that you need for society. We want those to stay. We, we don't want to lose those things. It's not just about jobs. I understand this completely. Rural communities in Nova Scotia are fading away, and with them a way of life that people rightly treasure. But net cage aquaculture is not a big source of good jobs. Cook Aquaculture has promised that when its various leases produce a sufficient supply of fish, about 3 million fish a year, it will build a processing plant in Shelburne and hire 350 full-time workers. But a South Shore journalist recently noted that depending on the level of automation, a fish plant worker can process about 26 fish an hour. At that rate, 3 million fish would only require about 60 workers, not 350. Cook's plans received a major setback in the spring of 2012 when an outbreak of infectious salmon anemia required the destruction of all the fish in its existing Shelburne cages. Cook abandoned one of its applications for new sites, Shelburne's entire harbour is apparently under quarantine, and the outbreak may give a year's breathing space for nearby Jordan Bay, which was slated for two huge sites. But the loss of those salmon won't affect Cook's bottom line. I'm given to understand that when a open pen firm has a uh, mass mortality issue with, with their salmon, that they now have it designated that this is a crop. Uh, salmon farmers are, are raising a crop and they are compensated for the losses associated with the demise of that crop. Um, that's another thing I couldn't believe. If in our lobster storage facility we suffer mortality for any one of 50 possible reasons, um, no one says, look, can we compensate you for that loss? The compensation isn't cheap. The reasonable market value that an owner could expect to receive for the fish up to a maximum of $30 Canadian. The reasonable market value presumably includes the anticipated profit. In Shelburne, about 700,000 fish were destroyed. That means compensation of up to $21 million, including perhaps $5 million in profit. In New Brunswick, the provincial and federal governments have forked over more than $75 million in compensation to aquaculture companies for losses due to ISA. Fish farms eat up taxpayers' money as naturally as salmon eats sardines. And every new farm that the government approves increases the taxpayers' risk which raises the question, what's in this for us, for the taxpayers, for the government? The lease payments for salmon pen sites are absurd, less than $350 a year for a site that can earn $22 million every two years. There are no property taxes on sites in the ocean. And, as Inka Molesky notes, you and I were major investors in the companies in the first place. When we did our first report, we dug into um, ACOA Files. We made right to information requests to the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agencies and found that the industry had been given millions and millions of dollars um, in loans, forgivable loans, free money to get established. Uh, the industry got established because federal money made it happen. And then, when things do go wrong, like an outbreak of ISA, the governments compensate the industry for its losses. Nova Scotia can't afford school librarians. It's cutting $30 million from its educational budget, and it's welcoming an industry that can soak up $21 million for a single outbreak of disease. How can we afford an industry like this? 
And although I can easily understand Shelburne's thirst for industrial jobs, what accounts for the government's insistence on foisting salmon feedlots on the eastern shore? The application down there comes from Snow Island Salmon, the Canadian affiliate of the Scottish company Loch Duart, which calls itself the Sustainable Salmon Company. Shane Borthwick, Snow Island's Vice President Operations, grew up in a family aquaculture business in New Brunswick. He's been operating a single farm in Nova Scotia for a decade, and he says he's had no escapes, no diseases, no sea lice, and no pesticides. Snow Island has applied to start what Shane Borthwick calls a model that involves stocking and fallowing four widely separated farms in rotation near Sheet Harbour. Our model, just to touch on maybe the model overall, is, is a four-year model whereby we stock any farm once every four years. So what that, what that does is it takes a year and a half roughly to get them up to size, a year to harvest them, you know, 12-month harvest cycle, and then an 18-month fallow period. Our model also calls for up to 500,000 fish per farm, which is far less than what you'll see in many of the larger models. Uh, we have three kilometer minimum distance uh, between production classes so that we don't have influence from one generation of fish to the next generation of fish. Oftentimes it'll be far more than three kilometers. We want to crawl before we walk, walk before we run. If we can prove what we believe will work, then we hope that more and more people will embrace this model. Snow Island's people seem respectful and reasonable, and their whole approach stands as an implicit criticism of standard industry practice. Snow Island is actually trying to address problems that other operators don't even acknowledge. In Scotland, however, Loch Duart has faced the usual issues with sea lice, pesticides and escapes, and although following the farms reduces the problem with waste, it doesn't eliminate them. So, is Snow Island's model good enough? The community and its businesses don't think so. Stuart Lamont's business on the Eastern Shore does $21 million worth of business shipping lobster to 16 countries, and it's on the cusp of a remarkable expansion. In the last 18 days, we've had three separate visits from three significant buyers from China, uh, making their way from China to Pleasant Harbor, Tangier, Nova Scotia, to come see our facility, talk to us about business opportunity, see if they can build the relationship. The Chinese will pay 40 or $50 a pound for lobster, but they demand seafood that comes from a pristine environment. Pristine is, is our middle name, we like to think. The Eastern Shore is untainted territory. Uh, we have no industrial tarnish east or west. Food safety issues in China are considerable. Those Chinese with financial resources increasingly want products produced outside the country which they have no fear of uh, any kind of food safety damage. So our Canadian brand, which is, is pristine at its real core, uh, I believe it's, it's, it's an ideal time for not just a terrific product, but a safe food traceable product to go on their market. So um, uh, they, they see that in our product, they see that in our environment. Um, that's what they want. The Chinese know all about aquaculture. They lead the world in aquaculture, and exposure to aquaculture is exactly what their high-end consumers seek to avoid. So the fishing community on the eastern shore sees the advent of salmon cages as a huge threat to a business far more important than salmon farming could ever be. This open pen fish farming concept with three specific applications, and we're told many more to follow, um, it's caused a lot of anxiety. Uh, it's caused an association to be developed that's an ad hoc community group, Association for the Preservation of the Eastern Shore. It draws support from everywhere in the community and people have been contacting the association and saying, what can we do to make our concerns expressed? Uh, in the seafood sector in particular, we have nine companies and we have two associations have for the first time in, in the history of the commercial fishery spoken with one voice on this topic. We represent 1,000 jobs and we represent $175 million sales on an annual basis. By Nova Scotia standards, um, that isn't uh, small potatoes, that's significant and it isn't potential jobs or possible jobs down the road or possible sales or possible value. That's reality today. I talked to some of the people that I've dealt with in the environmental assessments. 
the, the we put in a lot of um, complaints about the environmental assessments, material on the data that was used in and out data, missing data, um, and some of the people I dealt with on the federal level said they've never seen anything like this, like the operation that's going on here, like the the the, the resistance against these salmon farms here. They've never they've never seen this much paperwork. They said generated for anything. There's people. With, there's nobody in favor of this. There, you wouldn't get 10 people on this piece of shore here that want anything to do with this stuff. And on the eastern shore, unlike the south shore in St. Mary's Bay, wild salmon are an important factor. On the whole Atlantic coast of Nova Scotia, acid rain has hammered salmon populations. But when the acidity is reversed, so is the decline of the salmon. Conservation groups like the Atlantic Salmon Federation and the Nova Scotia Salmon Association have spent more than 18,000 volunteer hours and nearly a million dollars in cash on a lime doser to spread lime into the West River Sheet Harbor. The experiment has shown a remarkable increase in the number of juvenile salmon, or smolts. We're seven years since we started liming. This is a 10-year pilot project. And what we're, what we're seeing, if the we do monitoring. We monitor invertebrates and we monitor pH, of course, and we monitor juvenile salmon densities. We've seen a 400% increase in smolt production in seven years since sliming. Salmon were considered extirpated from the West River in 2000. In 2011, the river produced 11,500 smolts. But these salmon, and this run, are fragile. They too need a pristine environment. I work for a group called the Ocean Tracking Network and um, what we do is we, we implant sort of state-of-the-art tracking technology, small little tags into the juvenile fish and we follow them as they migrate out through the river, through the estuary, into the ocean as part of the life cycle. It turns out that while most smolts move fairly smartly off towards the sea pastures of Greenland, smolts from this river and a couple of others hang around along the coast for a month or more, which gives them a much higher chance of encountering any salmon pens. Add to that some recent science out of Scandinavia that shows that stressed fish from, from acid rain rivers um, are actually more prone to being infected by sea lice. So if there's an issue with sea lice from the aquaculture facilities, um, which, which may very well occur, that our fish are actually more prone to being infected. Snow Island points out that its nearest sites are about 10 kilometers from the estuary of the West River. Well, the issue of distance is all relative. Um, from the fish perspective, from a salmon smoke perspective, we know that they go out um, and they, they gradually move offshore, um, but they're moving around quite a bit. So, the, the, you know, a, a 10 kilometer distance, for example, um, up the shore is, is actually not that far. Here is a heartbreaking story from the Bear River First Nation, which was always reliant on fish from its own river. The east branch of the river is blocked by a power dam, and the west branch, Franklin Creek, had been abused, degraded, and emptied of fish. The community decided to restore the creek. We uh, finally was able to convince a few salmon to come back up in the streams and started using some of our uh, spawning beds, which we really got excited, saying, wow, we've done it, and look at, look at this, this is beautiful, and here they were right in front of us using the spawning beds and, and then the next spring we went back and we found little juvenile fish and we were just so happy and we said we've done it so at some point in time you know we might be able to use some of those fish for our for our food and then one day we went down to the brook to do a little uh, work on it and we realized that there was the river was had we more fish in it than we had ever seen before and and it really got us excited at first said, oh look at this that must be a a big run just come in and we just got so excited then all of a sudden somebody said well there's something strange about that fish it doesn't look like a salmon somebody said well i don't know you know uh, but what are they doing out in the bay there in the basin aren't they doing some like aquaculture fishing or something like that, or pen fish out there, and I said, oh, maybe that's where they come from. The nut pen off Digby was indeed where they came from. The Bear River people ate them until a DFO officer found out and warned them against it. The fish had recently been inoculated. And then we found out later, as we talked, that these fish 
were pretty aggressive. Like they're, they're, they have to put on a lot of weight in a short period of time, uh, so they were they were designed to eat, 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 and we realized that they were having quite a uh, impact on our brood stock. The steelhead ate all the juvenile salmon, erasing in a few days the patient work of a whole community. Net cage salmon aquaculture is also a suspect in one of the great unheralded fishing collapses of recent years, the virtual disappearance of the salmon runs in the inner bay of Fundy rivers. Fifty years ago, more than 40,000 salmon returned to those rivers. Today that number is about 200, and the issue is not acid rain. In the Bay of Fundy, uh, in Nova Scotia, we have 23 rivers. Uh, the uh, wild stocks of which have simply disappeared. Um, and the rivers are still in perfectly good shape, so whatever has happened there has happened in salt water. And um, credible scientific sources are beginning to point fingers of suspicion at the aquaculture industry in the Bay of Fundy because the timing was the same uh, as we experienced in Norway, in Scotland, in Ireland, in British Columbia. So we believe that the, aqua, the open pen aquaculture salmon industry in um, the coast of New Brunswick, in the outer Bay of Fundy, has been um, very much uh, a part of the reason for the collapse of the, of the salmon in the Bay of Fundy. The industry would point at other factors, temperatures, urbanization, power dams, farm runoff, and so on. Fair enough. But those factors also affect other regions, like the Gulf of St. Lawrence rivers, where there aren't any salmon pens and where salmon runs are robust and growing. Science hasn't found a smoking gun. But this is a study of wild salmon populations in the vicinity of salmon feedlots around the world by the late legendary Dr. Ransom Myers. It shows that wild salmon survival near net pens is much lower than in other similar areas everywhere in the world and that clearly includes the Bay of Fundy. Not long ago, Nova Scotia promoted itself as a three-season salmon fishing destination. Today, it doesn't promote salmon fishing at all. And yet, a recent study by Gardner Pinfold Economic Consultants set the economic value of Atlantic salmon to Atlantic Canada at $255 million a year. If we think about the, the, the components of value, um, there's the angling, of course, which is upwards of $100 million, and the, um, the, the value that the public places on wild salmon as well, which would add another you know, 30 you know, odd million dollars. Um, we look at government expenditures, we look at uh, NGOs, we look at a, a range of, of people who are spending on wild salmon, whether to conserve it, to consume it, or just to, to enjoy the recreation of, uh, of, of salmon. So that fishery, we, we estimated, would be valued at, uh, at upwards of $150 million. Uh, that number has been as high as, uh, as uh, almost $200 million just based on the angling you know, in the, uh, the mid-1990s. Wild salmon, even now, account for nearly 4,000 jobs in Atlantic Canada. And people would be willing to pay more in taxes for salmon restoration and enhancement. They collectively agreed that, um, that salmon to this group was worth in the order of 25 to 30 million dollars. In other words, we value salmon simply because of its existence. And we would be prepared to increase our taxes, say in the order of 10, 12 dollars a year, in order to see more um, resources flow you know, to, uh, to conservation efforts, to improving the, uh, to, uh, you know, improving ha salmon habitat. This is fascinating because of what it says about our values. The great environmentalist Paul Hawken recently observed that people all over the world are showing the enormous personal dedication to the natural world that we see on the West River Sheet Harbor. And that this huge global effort makes the environmental movement the largest social movement in the history of the world. That's a phenomenon that governments and corporations ignore at their peril. And so, if I were involved with Snow Island and trying to establish a net cage operation on the eastern shore, I would be pushing for a moratorium myself. If it's possible for Snow Island to do net cage aquaculture sustainably, a huge if, nobody is going to believe that 
until that claim has been independently verified by qualified experts. In the meantime, they'll be seen as just another participant in a net cage salmon farming industry which is, to put it kindly, grasping, reckless, sly, and sometimes criminal. And everyone senses that the present plans for expansion are only the beginning. If the industry has its way, every little cove and inlet from Cape Sable to Cape Canso will be clogged with salmon farms. And that's not to mention a similar vast expansion apparently being planned for the south coast of Newfoundland. How has this salmon aquaculture expansion gone so incredibly wrong? The underlying failure, as with so many environmental issues, is a failure of accounting and critical thinking. Governments now assume that any increase in gross domestic product is growing the economy and is a good thing, and that government is responsible for making that happen. But GDP is a bankrupt indicator. What isn't counted doesn't count, and what isn't counted is most of what makes life worthwhile, like clean air and water, a healthy population in a healthy natural environment. None of this shows up in GDP. Furthermore, the GDP calculation only counts the jobs and dollars that may be gained by something like aquaculture, disregarding the existing jobs and dollars that may be lost. Meanwhile, the public pays the cash cost of corporate failure, while the environment pays the long-term non-cash costs. The other bewildering feature is the immovability of the Nova Scotia government. All that people are asking for is a moratorium, a pause for second thoughts, an opportunity to answer some very troubling questions. We went and, you know, took all of the concerns that were brought forth by fishermen, landowners, moms, dads, doctors, ministers, right? And, and, uh, and I don't mean ministers in the political sense. <laughs> And, and we, we put all of the, we, we wrote them down, we did, uh, we asked for them to give us letters on their own, we asked for them to write letters into government, and over the course of about 10 months, we were able to really have an enormous amount of documents sent in, both to our federal and provincial government, asking the strong questions. And what was so mind-boggling to us was the fact that nobody replied. We are accustomed to arrogance and paternalism from the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Several fishermen told us quite frankly that they believe DFO intends to eliminate independent fishermen altogether in favor of a corporate industry that would be much easier to administer. But what accounts for the lofty intransigence of the provincial government? Over and over again, people told us that they couldn't believe that an NDP government, a social democratic government, could be so environmentally insensitive, so enslaved to corporate priorities, so dismissive of the wishes of the communities they were elected to serve. What's going on behind the scenes? If they're in some sort of deal, which it looks like they are, they've made a deal with the devil somewhere and can't get out of it. In the Department of, of Fisheries and Agriculture, We've had the same deputy ministers, we have the same people working there year after year after year with their own point of view. And when a minister comes in, these people are telling him how great this all is and telling the government how great this is all, how it's, how it's good for everything, because they don't believe in nothing else. That's all they believe in. Is that our public consultation? One of the things that resonated most with me was um, uh, Sherry Pictou uh, of the Bear River, River First Nations, she spoke up at the end and she said, you know, wh where are we at today when democracy has been hijacked by big business? Whatever accounts for the mystery of the province's behavior, this situation is becoming mean and ugly. One fisherman told us that the cages proposed for his community would never go in the water. The local fishermen, fighting back in the only effective way left to them, would destroy the cages first. That's where this is going to end, he told me. It's going to make criminals out of honest people. It makes people so angry here that we know what the science says. They know what the science says. You know, DFO knows goddamn well 
and so does the, the Sterling Belleville, the Minister of Aquaculture. He knows damn well, and so does the Deputy Minister, and all of those high-paid bureaucrats who are in that department know full well what these things are doing to the environment because they have seen the science and they have ignored it intentionally to line the pockets of, of a company that's not even from here and also to try and grab some tax dollars for themselves. And it's shameful, it's shocking. And if your wishes mean nothing, if your community is powerless, if government can simply erase your citizenship on an issue this important to your livelihood and your family, the biggest, the strongest emotion you feel when you're a mom is you want to protect your kid and you want to know they're safe. And I don't feel safe. The bizarre thing is that we need aquaculture and it would be easy to devise an aquaculture policy that almost everyone could support. Alana Mitchell has been called the best environmental journalist in the world. She's the author of Seasick, the global ocean in crisis. In our lifetime, fish has gone from being mainly wild to mainly farmed as a, as a global you know, phenomenon, which is stunning. That, that's, but it is the next logical step. And there are lots of biologists who will argue that it's the only logical step, that, that it's, it's the natural progression and that we ought to be spending much more time farming fish than catching it in the wild. The problem is that it's in the detail and we're not, in most parts of the world, we're not doing fish farming in a very smart way. In most parts of the world, what we're doing is catching, still catching, little fish from the ocean to feed to these bigger fish that we're, that we're trying to grow in cages. Almost everyone who takes a hard look at this industry comes up with two questions. The first one is, wouldn't it be better to raise fish in closed tanks, either in the water or on land? Minister Beliveau says the government isn't opposed to closed containment, but the industry tells them it's not viable. The other end of the spectrum is closed containment, land-based commercial salmon farming. That just simply is not viable, contrary to the belief of many people. Um, I've visited many of those facilities in, in Norway, and they're simply not viable uh, at this stage. The industry says the fish would have to be packed too tightly, the cost of power to pump the water would be prohibitive, and so forth. All of which would be much more convincing if people weren't already doing closed containment all over the world with all kinds of different species in all kinds of places. People are raising fish in disused warehouses in Chicago, on the waterfront in Baltimore, in their backyards. There's a guy in the Bronx raising tilapia for the table in his bathtub. In Quebec, an outfit called Culture Aquaponique uses the same water to raise rainbow trout and Boston lettuce. In that system, waste equals food, just as it does in nature. The truth is that closed containment would be viable in a wink if we stopped subsidizing aquaculture companies for doing the wrong thing. The other big issue is why salmon? We tend to be very focused on Atlantic salmon. But 30 years ago, people weren't eating Atlantic salmon, except those who lived near rivers and, and caught the fish themselves. So fish farming industry has created a market for farmed Atlantic salmon. It could do so again for other species. Hutchings mentions bass, pickerel, sturgeon, arctic char, and various others. And in fact, we can also grow salmon sustainably. This tank is made of fiberglass and styrofoam, and it's full of salmon. It's floating in an inlet near Campbell River, BC, and its operating costs are not much greater than net cage systems. All its wastes are collected in a sump and composted into fertilizer. Agri-Marine Holdings also exports these tanks to China and sees good market prospects in Norway, the original home of the salmon farming industry, which has now banned net cage feedlots in certain districts. And this facility, near Seattle, raises coho salmon entirely in fresh water, far from the sea and surrounded by farmland. More than 95% of its water is recirculated it has no escapes, no lice, no pesticides, no disease, no untreated wastes. Sweet spring salmon's fish have achieved super green status from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch program, and they're now being grown in similar facilities in Montana, within sight of the Rocky Mountains. And just recently, the Atlantic Salmon Federation has begun harvesting Atlantic salmon from St. John Riverstock, 
raised in a demonstration project at a closed containment facility owned by the Conservation Fund Freshwater Institute in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. The fish were grown without sea lice, disease, antibiotics, or vaccines in water that was 99.8% recirculated. We are demonstrating to the industry and to DFO that the technology exists to, one, to raise the salmon, and two, we are crunching the numbers to prove that it's cost competitive or cost effective to do so. And, and the view is, you know, as we continue down this, this track, to, to hopefully work with the industry and engage the industry and engage the federal and provincial government so that we can take this, this knowledge and this new technology and maybe transition the current industry in the, in the Bay of Funday and uh, in other areas throughout eastern Canada more towards this land-based uh, salmon farming. I can tell you the quality is excellent. And when I asked Minister Beliveau about closed containment, I don't know why he didn't point out the leading edge closed containment fish farm that's already in operation in Nova Scotia, within an hour's drive of his office. We've been told time and time again that land-based closed containment fin fish aquaculture just won't work. It's not viable, it's not profitable, it's not sustainable, the technology just doesn't exist. Well, let's go see. Sustainable Blue began as a water filtration and recirculation company serving large aquarium operators around the world. It now raises European sea bass and sea bream in a closed containment fish farm in center Burlington on the Bay of Fundy. The company also manages a closed containment facility owned by the Millbrook First Nation near Truro, which produces Arctic char. Sustainable Blue's filtration systems allow the company to pump up murky, fundy water and have it crystal clear in a few hours, and 99.95% of the water is recirculated. All the fish wastes are captured and treated, there are no problems with parasites or disease, and the farm produces a kilo of farm fish from just two-thirds of a kilo of wild fish. The rest of the feed comes from other sources. I consider this technology on this site to be world-leading. It's proprietary. It's developed by one individual who's been working at this for 20 years. And the most important point is that it works. Um, if you canvass opinion, and probably even informed opinion, on uh, the merits of closed containment aquaculture for marine systems, I think most people who are informed on the subject would even say it's a great concept but the technology just doesn't work to make it commercially viable. So I know that with what we have developed here uh, I can say with conviction that our technology is at a level where it is most certainly commercially viable. Could they raise salmon? We could certainly raise salmon here. There's absolutely no reason why not. No reason except economics. Salmon was once a rarity, a high-priced delicacy, but today there's much more salmon growing in captivity than ever swam wild in the ocean. So salmon is now a commodity, like chicken. In the North American market, sea bass and bream are worth 50% to 70% more than salmon. But that raises another question. If your market is in, say, Toronto, and you're not raising your fish in the sea, why build your farm in Nova Scotia? Why not in a warehouse in Toronto? If you approach uh, general consumers and ask them for their opinion on farmed aquaculture product, um, they view the east coast of Canada as a, uh, a, a, a nice and a very natural place to produce um, farmed aquaculture product. And what that says to us, basically, is there is some marketing advantage for us in selling fish in Toronto that was raised in Nova Scotia. It carries a nice connotation with it. Once again, Nova Scotia's brand is a major asset, and it's all about purity. Cold, clean water, a pristine environment, just as it is for the lobster industry. Sustainable Blue's fish have received the approval of the Oceanwise Sustainable Seafood Program of the Vancouver Aquarium. And the fish is getting rave reviews from master chefs in Nova Scotia, Ontario, and Quebec. It's delicious. I'm impressed, and apparently I'm not the only one that's impressed. Recently, this facility was visited by an executive from a major Canadian food chain, who came out and said, I have seen the future. All these leading edge producers say they're responding to a substantial and growing market that's willing to pay more for safe, sustainably produced seafood.
So the most powerful player in this whole debate may be the informed consumer. Jim Gourley is a publisher, an ardent sports fisherman, and a restaurant operator. His restaurant serves only what he regards as wholesome food locally sourced. He won't offer farmed salmon because it won't be accepted by the kind of customer he's aiming to attract. The public is increasingly uh, demanding to know what they're eating. There are demands for more clarity and labeling. Uh, there are demands uh, to know source of food. Um, people want to know what they're consuming uh, with, with particular concern about chemicals, um, pesticides, uh, insecticides, and, and, and so forth. The general public has been quite ignorant of, of the realities of salmon. The public is salmon, well, salmon is salmon. Salmon is good for you. Omega-3 is good for you and so forth. Fatty fish is good for you. But only if it's not laced with toxins. It's true. Not many people would knowingly eat food that's been dyed and drugged and bathed in poisons to rid it of parasites. Pretty clearly, net cage salmon aquaculture is a primitive method of food production, the marine equivalent of slash and burn agriculture. In the end though, this story is not so much about fish and food as it is about values and power. When governments have been captured by corporations, your vote at the ballot box doesn't seem to matter very much but you also get to vote with this. You can cast your ballot, yay or nay, here, and here, and here, and here. And as more and more consumers refuse to buy this stuff, more and more grocery chains will stop selling it. Important chain stores in Western Canada and the United States, like Safeway, Overweighty, and Target, have already banished net pen salmon from their shelves. As we were wrapping up this program, the government released this new aquaculture strategy, which is big on generalities and short on specifics. It talks about monitoring, but not enforcement. It says that government and industry must engage in outreach and respond to local concerns. Fine words, but this document was produced without any community consultation at all, though the government did consult with the industry in the form of Bruce Hancock and his Aquaculture Association of Nova Scotia. And so the opposition just keeps growing. More than a hundred organizations, community groups, conservation groups, representatives of tourism, recreation, and the traditional fishery have now come together in a broad and growing coalition to oppose the granting of further net pen licenses and ultimately to call for the removal of existing net pens from Nova Scotia's coast. They've learned that simply marking a ballot every few years doesn't cut it anymore. If we want a better future, a renewed democracy, we'll have to forge it ourselves, in our communities, at public events, in the streets. That's actually what the people in all these community organizations are doing. This is what democracy looks like. I'm Silver Donald Cameron. Thanks for watching.